Well, let me come back here. How far behind? Oh, we're only 12 minutes off. Okay, are we ready to go? All right, and this is picking up? Okay, and can I sit down here? Everyone can hear him? Okay, I'll keep this up here. All right, well, this evening is devoted to three success stories. And uh, Osprey leading off with that, and then we're going to have the bobolinks, and then we're going to have the shorebirds. <coughs> and, you know, with all of the bleak news in the world, uh, why it's nice to have some success stories. And uh, these are three wonderful ones, and they didn't happen uh, just by accident. They've been the result of very conscious effort by a lot of people over a long period of time. <clears throat> and you'll see some of that. Fred has some great illustrations of, of people hard at work on preserving the uh, Gina and Betty and others who have played a role in all this. So uh, just, I, th I think most of you are familiar with the Osprey story and the terrible loss uh, during the uh, of uh, COVID, the, not COVID, it was COVID for the Osprey, it was the DDT, uh, that era. And let's, let's start, you know, just some scenes. I don't have a view, so I'm gonna have to come watch this with you, I guess. Scenes of nice scenes of the Westport River. Okay, keep on. And there is one of the Osprey platforms, which, uh, every, how many people have been out to visit an Osprey platform? Okay, how many people went out in that boat? <laughs> okay, that was a boat that Betty won in a raffle 20 years ago and we gave it to the Audubon 10 years later. It's called Lucky Me and it has been and it's been lucky for the Osprey. Okay, but we specialize in the Westport River in these salt marsh nests. And we had a great osprey expert from uh, Scotland who climbs up 70, 80, 100 feet in trees to check osprey nests. And he had such a ball here <laughs> climbing up a little uh, ladder to get up to the nest. He had such a good time, he brought his girlfriend and they created their first child <laughs> in our cottage. So, uh, you know, one thing, good thing leads to another. <laughs> But, okay, and this bountiful harvest with two question marks, and that's, uh, we'll see it some later. We got, the last year was a really rough year. Uh, the fish were not abundant, and that's probably, you know, does that, that, that may have adversely affect the camera operation. All right, I mean, Missing me won't be a great loss, okay. <laughs> anyway, we, last year, shortage of fish, and there were chicks that were starving. So, uh, it, uh, it is with question marks, the availability. Generally, it's been very good uh, for breeding, okay? <clears throat> and there are some of Alan's pictures of new chicks just out of the shell and go on to this, I love this, fish becoming bird. <laughs> <laughs> and mama feeding, and there's one growing up. And this is the Osprey hotspots. Uh, in earlier times, he didn't mention Martha's Vineyard. And I think that has been another important part spot. Gus Ben David, I think, is the sanctuary director who's been so important, but they are three very different types of situations in that Martha's Vineyard, the nest platforms are spread all around the uh, island and not concentrated, whereas in this area they're all concentrated in the river. And one of the interesting, let's go to the next slide. Well, this was one of the famous early birders who recorded 
the Osprey on this south coast of Massachusetts. Arthur Cleveland Bent from Taunton wrote 21 booklets on the birds of North America uh, back in the early 20th century. Outstanding birders spent a lot of time down here at Westport. And here's from 1897 on this platform that ended up at the top of a flagpole. And they put those in on purpose because... But, you know, the farmers put them in because the osprey kept the uh, other raptors away. The cooper's hawk. And so the chicken hawk. Yeah, the chicken or hawk. the duck hawk when you come in. Right. So that was uh, encouraged. There's one up in a tree in 1913. Okay. And then came the DDT and the spraying and the uh, affecting flowing into the uh, rivers and streams and into the fish. And that destroyed the viability of the shells for the osprey eggs especially. And from that uh, was Roger Torrey Peterson and Paul Spitzer and other people from Connecticut who really pioneered in bringing in eggs and incubating them and doing breeding here and restoring that population. And so, and then Gil Fernandez and his wife Jo set up the platforms that were inspired by the people from Connecticut. And <coughs> that's what got it started. And how many knew Joe for Gil Fernandez? Okay. Yeah, I kept trying to get him to let me go with him. Uh, he kept saying, yes, 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 but uh, there's no no in your eyes, as they say. And so it was until he finally quit that I got started and Alan Poole came along. Anyway, here's Westport and the Vineyard, uh, recovering from the uh, DDT era and rising up very sharply in terms of active pairs. Uh, and comparing the two, I think, is this Lauren? Amanda. Amanda, okay. All right, new one. Okay, and here's high nest density, as you're aware. And we have one favorite nest, W3, that we view from our upstairs window. And the male arrived in late March, and he's sitting out there, sitting out there, waiting, waiting, I'd get up every morning, go look, and he was still sitting alone. Well, uh, beginning of this week, she finally showed up. <laughs> and we're not sure whether it's the, uh, from the past or whether it's a new girlfriend, but at least there are two of them out there and they're doing what they should. <laughs> so anyway, a very high density here. Uh, they have 20 nests per square kilometer. It also was true over in Gardner's Island, but much more dispersed in the other areas. And these are the fish that Alan would tell you all about, and I don't know a damn thing about them. So <laughs> you, you, you've come up with your own images. Anyway, these are the fish that the osprey feed on yeah, here. Fred can tell us. Fred can tell us. But you have to, yeah. you have to get up. Okay, so this would be, um, this would be a river herring here yeah. at Alewife. This would be a menhaden okay. in the summer. Giant schools of these. That's right. Um, this but is the menhaden failed this year, wasn't it? Yeah, menhaden is an interesting story in itself. Okay. Um, this is a scup, a summer Sc fish. Okay. Very deep water. This is a winter flounder, I believe, or a yeah. summer flounder. That used to be dominant in fish in osprey diets, and it's much less so because... See, they've been overfished. They've been overfished. Like most of these fish. I believe this is a white perch. Uh, Tautog, and the mystery fish. Mystery yeah. fish. Okay. Right Whoever guesses the fish gets a prize. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, those are the fish. This is a not very healthy looking scene. Uh, I'm not sure why it's there, but it, Alan put it in, so it's there. Uh, anyway, the Manhattan catch has gone down. Some good years, but recent times it's been way down and the but here's an osprey coming in after one beautiful picture 
and a lot of fishermen overfishing. And there's your river herring, as you mentioned. And uh, then struggles for the fish getting upstream to breed because of dams and lack of fish ladders. Been repaired in some areas, but uh, and dams taken out in other areas, but that's been a barrier. Okay, river herring decline and down to um, pretty low levels in three rivers that he depicted. If Alan were here, he'd tell you all about it. Uh, and here's a winter flounder. And they've declined. And so the feeding of osprey, as you see here, is the big one is the herring, and then the menhaden and scalp, blackfish perch, and then a big unknown. And Alan was always trying to get graduate students from Cornell or wherever to come and sit out there for hours in the day <laughs> to see what fish the, the birds were bringing in and record them. And that was what I tried to get my grandson to do, but he bowed out. So. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing about that, what I recall Alan talking about, is that herring is really how we get the eggs, or the female is bulked up given the nutrients she needs to produce the eggs, and then menhaden is what feeds the chicks. Mm -hmm. So the, that seasonality and of, of available fish is really important for different stages. Okay, and here's the uh, breeding success. This was a, an older chart that Alan had, and it uh, shows reasonably good up and down, but then Matt produced a chart uh, last year, which I've put in as the next one, I believe. No? Okay, that's still population leveled off down there. Go on to Matt's chart. There it is, okay. Uh, this is the five-year averages for uh, the late 2005 to 2009 and then 2019 to 23. And you can see the increase in the number of nests and the activeness and the successfulness have gone up pretty sharply. Uh, eggs laid up by 50%. And eggs hatched, 6, 12, that's over 50%. And birds fledged, uh, 90 to 145. But anyway, the higher number of nests and higher rates of success. And so that's the good sign. And looking ahead, it's 10 minutes to 7, so it's time for the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> but if there's any... Okay. Thank you very much for a ringer. I'm just going to pass around just during the transition. This is an osprey, and this really, how many of you recognize it? Yeah. I wanted to raise your hand if you see an osprey nest regularly in your daily. Pretty impressive. One thing, we are out of the woods in terms of osprey um, imperilment. They are no longer the least bit imperiled. That's, that's all. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Success story. <laughs> all right, let's get started. Okay, I just before Fred starts, I want to just say Fred introduced Betty and me to Bertie. Uh, we had been scuba divers in. Indonesia and Southeast Asia for seven years and we came home and were looking for something to replace scuba diving and we went and took Fred's course over at the Lloyd Center and he got us hooked and the way he really did it was at the end of the thing he finished his instruction and then he heard this bird calling and he said great crested flycatcher <laughs> just hearing it and wow. <laughs> so that we chased birds all around the world as a result of that. And, uh, wow, uh, so it's all his fault. <laughs> all right. Okay, Fred, for go that. for it. Well, I want to talk about bobolinks and grassland. Um, it's in, uh, bobolinks are one of my favorite birds. 
And I thought we'd first introduce you to the Bobolink, in case you're not familiar with it, and um, do a couple of intro talks. My wife Amy's going to uh, read a couple of paragraphs from a book by a local author about, uh, which is a, um, <laughs> which is a sequel to *Wind in the Willows*, set on the Westport River. Okay. All right. Can you see? Okay. I think so. Yeah, I can see. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so this is from. The book, In the Wake of the Willows, by Frederick Thurber. <laughs> and Yes, and by the way, that class that the two of you took, I think I was there, and that's how I ended up getting to know Fred. And You're kidding. No way. Whoa. That was an important Lloyd Center class on bird <laughs> identification in the history of the birds of the area. Anyway, okay, so this is uh, from Chapter 7 called The King of the Meadow, and we wanted to give you an idea of what bobolinks mean to us and why we find them so intriguing and important, and hopefully you'll share that. Ricky loved the meadow. If she was ever down in the mouth, or tired, or discouraged, a visit to the meadow would set her right. It was not just the wildflowers by day and the fireflies by night, but it was also the theater and the stage for the irrepressible bobolink. Never had she Never had she met one so boastful and excited and cheerful and confident and impulsive and noisy, noisy, noisy. How could you not love a creature such as this? No bird was so optimistic, so excited, and so enthusiastic as the bobolink. He simply absolutely positively had to tell everyone how delighted he was from dawn to dusk and from spring to fall. He may look comical trying to balance on a nodding stalk of blue stem, but he would never admit it. The bobolink's words came forth like the sparkling waterfall, one on top of the other in a joyous jumble of sounds. His notes went up and down like country, a country lane on a hummocky farm. Mm -hmm. He was sunshine and lupins and honeybees and butterflies all wrapped into one. Good. So, are we gonna get the video? So Matt's going to do um, a video I just discovered a few minutes ago by Lang Elliott. So I wanted to just uh, give you an introduction to uh, the song of the bobolink and also uh, some images of it. And to give you some idea why this bird excites me so much. Sorry, I'm having an issue right now. <laughs> okay. And there, uh, one of uh, Barry Van Dusen's images on the wall, paintings on the wall, is of the bobolink. Yeah. Yes. Well, I guess we could just do the slideshow then. Oh, oh, oh. Do you need the, uh, you need the microphone? We need the audio. Why don't you put his new microphone next to him? We could. I think it's like playing out of the projector. I don't know. We didn't test this before. <laughs> All righty then. Put the microphone next to it. Put, put the microphone next to it. Oh. I'm hearing something now, man. Yes. It does yeah. match. Yeah. That's it. Hmm. <laughs> Check. Is it coming out? Is it coming out of the laptop? It's an incredibly exuberant song. And he's singing multiple notes at once, as you'll see in, in a few minutes. Handsome devil, too. Oh. You can hear there's a bunch of bobolinks mm -hmm. here, not just one. And this is typically what you see in, in a successful bobolink field. We have a whole flock of them. They're all competing in the, for the sound waves. It's really quite exciting, at least for me. <laughs> now, this, this is amazing. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> so mi he's mixing multiple sounds all at once, a jumble of notes. Okay. Wayne right. Peterson is the greatest person at explaining how they have multiple voices at the same time. If you ever run into Wayne and he's at a bar, why get him to explain it to you. <laughs> Very good. Uh, he's Wayne. really good. So I wanted to just to spend a few minutes here talking about my favorite bird and an amazing project that was done at Allen's Pond. Sort of a stealthy project. Um, people at Audubon and birders know about it, but the general public doesn't know about this amazing project and this amazing success story. Um, but, but as you probably know, the bobolink is in big trouble. Um, and, and the reason is um, it's loss of habitat. And um, I just wanted to send, spend a few slides explaining how serious this loss was and what's been done to address this situation. So next slide. So let's look at the loss of other habitats in the world. So 26 to about 35% of the Amazon rainforest has been lost or highly degraded. And amazingly enough, it's even worse in the Pacific Northwest. So 72% of the old growth conifer forest in the Pacific Northwest has been left. That's a rainforest also. Um, and it's getting sort of uncomfortably close to us. Um, Washington State, 90 80 to 90% of old growth forests has been gone, and only less than 10% of Oregon's old growth remains. That's pretty devastating. But how about North American grasslands? How does that compare? Is that better or worse? We'll find out. Let's check it out. So uh, there's a lot of different grasslands in North America. Um, I don't know if you can call the Chihuahua Desert a grassland, but anyway, <laughs> um, what we're interested in here is a tall grass prairie and the mixed grass prairie. And these are the, um, the homes, the short grass prairie to some extent. These are the homes, the grassland birds that we're so familiar with. So let's look at what happened to the tall grass prairie. Look at the devastation to our native uh, habitat of this grassland prairie. It's unbelievable what we've done to it. This is way, way worse than the Amazon or even the Pacific Northwest. And even in places like Illinois and Indiana, that 99.9% is even worse than that because what's remaining of those grasslands are just isolated little patches along railroad right-of-ways or along roadways. And not a large enough tracks for any grassland birds. The, uh, the uh, bobolinks in, in these areas are so degraded that Noah Perlich from University of Vermont was saying that uh, if they ever restore the, some of those areas, they're going to have to get a po the population from New England to reestablish in these places. They're, they're genetically similar, apparently. Now, if you go back a second, um, there's, you do see that um, Kansas and Oklahoma still have some grasslands, but this is mostly in these tall grass preserves that were unsuitable for farming or cultivation. Um, these are some places I really need to go to. Uh, fantastic, thousands and thousands of acres of, of uh, native grassland. Okay, next. So let's step back a little bit and try to get some history on the grasslands in New England. 18th and 19th century, New England was a very pastoral uh, area with lots of extensive grasslands. Okay, next. The grassland birds um, were all over the place. Bobolinks were common as a robin today, probably, or starlings. Uh, Meadowlarks also are very common. And even upland sandpipers, which require about 1,000 acres, um, were also not uncommon. Bobwhites were all over the place, harriers, of course, and uh, lots of interesting grassland sparrows. The bobolinks were celebrated by uh, Thoreau, Audubon, Burroughs, Whitman, Dickinson, and all the writer, natural history writers at that time, especially Emily Dickinson. She mentioned uh, bobolinks about 20 times. So it's probably one of her favorite birds. And I was reading uh, Mark Catesby's uh, journals, and I stumbled upon this amazing uh, account of him staying up all night uh, on the deck of a sloop in the Bahamas and listening to bobolinks flying over all night long. <laughs> and this sort of reminds me of what Audubon experienced with the passenger pigeon, where he, for three or four days the skies were blackened by the, uh, the passenger pigeons going north. But this is just, just indicates an enormous number of birds are flying into New England and other places in, in the Maritimes. So obviously there was a huge explosion of these grassland birds at that time frame. But the question is, are they native to this area? And are the grasslands native to this area? Well, it certainly seems that the grasslands were always in New England, at least since human habitation. The earliest explorers um, who sailed along the coast of New England noted these vast savannas 
the uh, First Nation or Native Americans had done a, a lot of burning and clearing uh, to help with wildlife. So there is, and there's also um, habitat along river bottoms and beaver meadows. So there was definitely grassland there. I can't really get a, a handle on what kind of grassland birds were there at that time, but probably at least bobolinks and savanna sparrows. <coughs> okay. So right now, uh, you can see this angry meadowlark here, <laughs> and he is probably watching a mower. Oh, yeah. Very unhappy. And I've actually almost seen. I've seen. Metal arcs versus mowers. It's not a pretty sight. Um, anyway, the grasslands are one of the most endangered habitats in New England. And I'm talking about uh, grasslands that are suitable for grassland birds, not the artificial grasslands like golf courses. Mm -hmm. And according to the Mass Audubon, this is amazing, grassland birds have shown the steepest, most consistent, and widespread decline of any group of North American birds. So bobolinks experiences 5% annual drop, which is really devastating. Um, this is in New England. It recently it slowed down to only about 2%, but that's probably because there's almost nothing left. Uh, New Hampshire is still losing at a, a pretty brisk pace, but that'll slow down also when they lose the rest of their bobolinks. Now, let's go to the next slide. There's a lot of problems with uh, birds in North America and declines, and there are some, a lot of the cases you don't know what causes the decline, like a loggerhead shrike. Nobody knows why loggerhead shrikes are disappearing. Uh, and maybe the warble if you don't know why they're disappearing. But with bobolinks, we know exactly why they're disappearing. And this has been proved by the experiments done at Allen's Pond. And that the problem is the haying schedules. Farmers want to get more than one crop out of the hay, and they especially want to cut early in June when the hay is more nutritious. Um, and the problem is of cutting in early June or late May, they're actually cutting earlier now as the climate changes, is that this is the, when the bobolinks are nesting. Um, so the haying uh, will destroy the nest. You can see the little bobolink babies in those rolled up rolls. Well, not actually. <laughs> but. The, the bobolinks experience just about 100% nest mortality when the field is, is mowed. Not only do they get sucked up into the haying machines, but if they don't, um, they're exposed. And you can actually see um, crows and, and gulls swooping in behind the mowing machines, eat, catching the baby um, bobolinks and other grassland birds, and insects too, of course. Um, so yeah, and the one thing I must emphasize that there's no re-nesting after mowing in June. Uh, landowners and farmers would like to have you believe that the bobolinks will re-nest, but it has not been shown to be the case, at least in our area. Maybe in northern Vermont, but not in the area. It's never shown. What happens is that the bobolinks will, the parents, will abandon the nest area and go to adjacent areas and mope around for the rest of the summer, then fly 12,000 miles back to Argentina spend the winter there, and then fly 12,000 miles back up here, and then try to re-nest again. Um, so I talked to a lot of landowners, and they say they need the hay, and OK, that's possible. But unfortunately, a lot of the landowners are cutting just for the appearance. They like the aesthetics. They like the look of a, a, you know, a freshly scalped field. Um, so I think it's a two-pronged problem as far as getting the cuts delayed. One is to delay the cutting, and, and there's some issues there I'll talk about in a second, and also to change the uh, land aesthetic to where people, if people can experience what a beautiful uh, uh, warm grass prairie looks like, they might change their mind about what looks good and what doesn't. Anyway, next. So Mass Audubon was very, very uh, concerned about this loss of grasslands. and. Um, Andrea Jones and Peter Vickery did some landmark studies on grasslands in New England. And um, Andrea decided that they were going to try an experiment in our area. Um, so they had acquired some land, the Isaacs property that I'll show in a second. And Andrea came up with a plan for restoring this land. This is a, it's a hard scrabble cornfield, how to restore it and try to get the grassland birds back. In addition, she wanted to experiment with um, warm season grasses. And I'll talk to you about warm season grasses in a second. 
So the first thing you had to do was get rid of all the junk plants and all, all the garbage on the fields. And then she was going to try to establish these warm season grasses and forbs and wildflowers and, and legumes and, it's just, it's, and adjust the mix for the soil moisture. And they also, since they own the land, they had to carefully control the haying, which is so important for birds. They, don't, they were not going to cut too early. They probably the first cut would be late July, early August, and give the uh, birds a chance to fledge. Um, and but you cannot not cut. You've got to cut at some point, or else these fields will revert back to woodlands. So anyway, so we're going to. She was going to. She just planned to create this grassland and hope that the birds come back. So, key to this plan is the warm season grasses. And uh, Andrew did a lot of research about the proper mix, and they made various mixes, that and they even adjusted the mixes based on how moist it was. If there's a moist area, they put more cord grass in. Otherwise, they used the big, the big three, as I call them, the big blue stem, switchgrass, and Indian grass. Now, I should note that these warm season grasses aren't strictly needed. If you have a large field, you do not have to go through this Herculean effort that Mass Audubon did to get the bobolinks. All you have to do is be careful with the hang. But Mass Audubon went in full bore, and this is just an amazing project. Um, so anyway, the warm season grasses are very attractive because it's a native grass, um, and it creates really good forage in the summer. These cool season grasses in almost all the meadows in this area has junky grass in the summer. But these warm season grasses have really peak uh, forage quality in the summer. High drought tolerance and climate resistance, they have very deep roots. Um, low maintenance, they don't really need any chemicals or fertilizer or lime usually. And better cover for birds. Some of these are clumping grasses so the birds can scamper around under the grass. And interestingly enough, I think the aesthetics are much nicer. I much prefer this beautiful warm season grass to an astroturf green grass. But the ironic thing is those astroturf green grasses turn brown in the summer while the warm season grasses look beautiful. All right, here's the start. And Gina was in on this, so she knows all about this. <laughs> they, they, Audubon bought 201 acres of the Isaacs farm down along Allen's Pond. And 55 acres of it was <clears throat> a grassland, very barren. Tensely farmed, barren, hard scrabble, uh, silage corn was, was used there with tons of chemicals. Um, but uh, the con they had a corn contract, it expired in 2000, and then they got to work. Here's the leadership team. These are the heroes of this conversion. Gina, was sanctuary director, and Andrea Jones. Lauren was uh, the property manager for the middle years as the, place, as the grassland was getting established. And uh, Jean Albanese is the, um, was the grassland ecologist, now senior conservation ecologist. He is the grassland expert who's been tuning and experimenting with these fields. Here are the workers. Um, they had Audubon workers and interns, a massive project. Hundreds of people were involved. Um, SCA Conservation Corps, lots of local volunteers, including my son, and incarcerated people like these two hardened criminals over here. <laughs> Paying their debt to society. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do with them. Cute couple. Yeah. <laughs> um, I talked to Andrea about this, and she said that um, the <clears throat> incarcerated people, as they say, actually had a good time doing this. Yes. They got good food, and they got ice cream sandwiches, which was very important. They loved working in these fields. So it was a great community effort. So... The work begins, and it was rough at the beginning. You can see, I believe these are uh, AmeriCorps workers on the right. Um, they cleared brush and woody plants and trees and, and worked very hard on these invasives, such as the multiflora rose and the cool weather grasses and phragmites. And each one of these uh, invasives required a different strategy that I'm not going to get into. Um, but there was an epic battle against the Johnson grass. And you can see Andrea Jones there on the left looking disgusted <laughs> as she pulls out the long, amazing roots of the Johnson grass. This stuff can go 100 feet underground and pop up. So it was an epic battle with herbicides and black plastic and God knows what else. Um, also, um, it was a community effort. Um, I believe there was a guy from um, Sylvan's Nursery who came over with a tractor and tilled the land for them for free, which was very nice. 
And also they acquired a seed drill um, because some of these warm season grasses, such as the big blue stem, are very fluffy and will blow away in the wind. So they had to drill it into the ground. It was a massive effort. Okay. Ah, well, things start to change pretty quick. In only a few years, uh, the warm season grasses started to move in. And then in 2002, the first savanna sparrow started nesting. And then in 2005, the first bobolinks nest. Okay. And from there, wow, what an explosion. Look at these numbers. <laughs> they go from seven pairs to 18 pairs to 33 pairs, and then 45 males and 59 females in 2023. Now, probably from what I heard, there were probably about 30 breeding females, and the rest were um, birds that had been displaced by the <clears throat> unfortunate early mowing in adjacent fields. But still, it's very, very impressive. And um, I don't know if you've ever been to these fields, but it is wild. These birds are all over the place, uh, displaying and flying back and forth and, and singing up, it's singing like crazy. It's really, really an exciting place, at least for someone like me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Warm season grasses are very significant, and it's really Audubon at its best here, because not only are you preserving open space, you provide a habitat for endangered birds, it's also a platform for research. And this project, this is, doesn't even really have a name except the warm season grasses. It's very stealthy. Nobody outside of this room really knows what, what went on here and how important and dramatic this changeover was. Um, and I don't know of any other project that's similar to it. There's something called the Bobolink Project, which pays farmers not to hay early um, on their own land. But the, I don't know of any other warm season grasses um, on a big, big scale that uh, compares to this. These, uh, this grassland is also an area for research. Um, it's, it's some important information has been found out about grass mixtures and what works and what doesn't and mowing schedules. One of the most significant uh, findings was that uh, farmers can, in a way, get two crops of grass out of a warm season grassland. If you do early light grazing, not haying, and then you can do a late harvest of the extremely high quality warm season grasses. Um, I've heard that Gene has been doing some experimentation uh, with various fields to try to get meadow larks to nest. The meadow larks come there in the winter, but they haven't nested there in the summer yet. And I believe there's also some interest in saltwater intrusion as the water level goes up. So anyway, this is, that's the end of my program. Any questions? Um, Blair, where are the fields that we should go in? They're hidden. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. You can't get to them. Uh, actually, the grassland loop is a part of our trail system, and if you park at Allen's Neck uh, Parking and follow the woodland loop. And I recommend, if you want to get there faster, take the first left. Um, don't, the, the woodland loop is a loop, and you want to go the left version because it's shorter than the right version, or the straight version. Um, go July. Go July. And bring bug juice. Yeah. And it's even pretty June, wild. Even June, June is lovely. June is lovely, too. Yeah. yeah Garrett has a question. Are, are, the, um, are the warm season grasses um, stable over time, and will they be, be displaced by other plants? That's a very good question. I, I think that a big blue stem can actually dominate a field. There, we have seen different responses in, in different places, <clears throat> and that is something we just have to stay on top of. Um, so there have been fields that eventually clover moves in simply because the conditions are right for moisture and whatever else in the soil. And clover isn't really what we want. Uh, but so sometimes we've done some overseeding. And um, at one point, we had an overabundance of timothy. Uh, so we just have to be responsive to things that move in. But this and is your research. Yep, that's part of the research. I encourage you to take on your talk. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Number three. Number three. Do I even need this?
Does it help a lot? Yes. Okay. I will yes. use it then. Um, all right. So I'm going to talk about shorebirds. And uh, I'm specifically going to specifically going to talk about three species that um, I'll introduce my thoughts through three species. I want to go through their distinctions, uh, some of the rising concerns, and how any of us can take part and help. First, what I want to do, however, is acknowledge that uh, wildlife habitats are located on the traditional, contemporary, and unceded territories of several indigenous nations, including the Massachusetts, Mohican, Nauset, Penacook, Pocumtuck, Wabanaki, and Wampanoag. These lands were often taken from the, uh, were often taken from the indigenous people, creating a legacy of injustice that persists to this day. Um, we acknowledge that indigenous stewardship of the land we now call Massachusetts kept its ecological and human communities vibrant, strong, and interconnected for thousands of years. And to this day, indigenous peoples, including the 37,000 individuals who currently reside in Massachusetts, are still at the forefront of climate action, ecological stewardship, and environmental justice. Mass Audubon is committed to the work of learning, listening, and evolving so that someday soon we may live in right rela relationship with the people who have been the rightful stewards of this land for thousands of years. So, starting off, what is a shorebird? It's a name we have given it, um, and, and yet it is uh, a class, uh, it's a noun, it's any bird that frequents the shore. Pretty straightforward. Uh, in, in, in some places, you might just call it any wading bird right, that is at the shoreside. And in England, uh, the term for sandpiper, I believe, is wader. They use wader when we use sandpiper. Um, so technically, from an ornithological perspective, it's a diverse group of birds within the order uh, charadriform, and that it comprises the sandpipers, plovers, avocets, oyster catchers, and phalaropes. As you can see, there's hundreds of these species, and, uh, and 81 of them, uh, a good portion of them, are in the Americas for some or a portion of their life cycle. 52 breed in, in uh, North America, and, uh, and I'm going to talk about just uh, three of these. So they're one from each of those of the families that are in this, uh, in this order, and we've got the American oyster catcher, piping plover, and the red knot. And I'm presenting them as gems because I'm try I want to conjure the notion of treasure inheritance, value across time and place. These birds are rare and difficult to find. Many of us have seen some of these birds, but many, many other people in the world, the vast majority of people in the world, have not seen the three gems that I'm going to describe. They all have three things in common, or a few things in common. They nest on the ground. So many people don't realize that birds nest in the ground. That's not a given, and yet hundreds, I mean hundreds of species nest on the ground. These, all these, uh, the th these three birds all produce one brood, and their chicks are mobile soon after hatch, so they're up and running. They also occupy precarious habitats where the combined threats of uh, pollution, sea level rise, climate change, any of those things can make their future less certain. And I just want to throw out there that once you get to know them, you can't help but s consider that they really epitomize some good core traditional values, family <laughs> values, which I'll get into in a little bit later. All right, so um, we're going to start with the showstopper. Uh, the American oyster catcher, hard to believe when you see that. How many of you have seen an American oyster catcher? Oh, see, 
you go to any, most any other community, you go out to, uh, I don't know, some place in Chicago, you're not going to get that kind of response. <laughs> All right. Um, these are stocky, sturdy birds. They have long legs. And really, I mean, look at those legs. Those are like something else. Um, they also have this heavy, and you might say, ostentatious bill. It really stands out. It's, it's our equivalent of a puffin or a pelican, right? Um, you can switch. And uh, they use this bill, in fact, to eat oysters. Um, they catch oysters, they, and they can, they're what, the only bird equipped to actually open up an oyster shell. And they, uh, or break it open. They are, um, they do it in two different methods. At low tide, or when the mussel beds or, or oyster beds are exposed and the, and the animal is, is, op is uh, its shell is open, stealthy, stealthy oyster catcher comes along and jabs its bill in straight at the addu adductor muscle. The, that's the muscle that closes it up fast and they sever that muscle in one swoop. So the precision, you know, that like yeah. <laughs> very little room for error. And, um, and, and they have to actually sever it so successfully because it has been known that they actually, the muscle can, or oyster can clamp, if they don't get it right, the um, shell can clamp on that uh, <laughs> bird and, and actually, you know, make a bad day for it. Um, <laughs> the, the other method is that the, if the mussels aren't exposed or, or oysters aren't exposed and open, given the tide, they'll, um, they can go to wade through an area and pick out a shell, and then they'll carry it elsewhere to a firm substrate, and then they'll hammer at it like a pickaxe, but they're hammering at that same adductor muscle. And that's how they're able to, once again, loosen the tight bind that the, uh, that the shellfish has on it. And in the process of all of this excavating these very hard to get to food resources, they often make a bit of a mess. And so other birds have learned that there's a little bit of a, a, a you know, a, a material left behind that they can, the scraps and the and the crumbs are there for the picking. So they often draw ruddy turnstones, other birds to them as they are um, in the process of of eating. So you can move to the next. Um, so there are a couple of things that you might not know. Uh, they're really actually long lived. One of the birds that was banded as an adult was recited 20 years later. They don't know how old it was when it was an adult, when they banded it. So these could be 20, 25-year-old birds. Uh, once mated, during the mating season, they stay quite close together. And I've, I mean, I think we've all seen that, where there's like two together quite a bit. And, uh, and that's typical. But they migrate solo. They don't <laughs> stay together, kind of like some of our other birds we know, like osprey, they, they go separate, they're separate ways every year. Um, and they, and you, and one thing to pay attention to is, if, to find them, is just listen to, for their call. It's kind of simple and almost, almost like a laughing gull, and it's, it just, um, I'm not going to be able to imitate it, but um, it's, it's a little noticeable. Uh, they arrive early, and they're often the first to nest. Uh, and before they, when they first arrive and they're flying around, they might be conspicuous, showing off that bright bill and making their calls and sticking together. But once they get into nesting, they're very sneaky, and it'll be very hard to find them. And it's also really hard to find the nests at that point. Um, so you can go to the next one. So when they have, once they begin their um, nesting, they have a clutch of about two to three eggs, and they're fairly large, almost as big as a chicken egg. And um, they hatch in just under four weeks. Uh, again, the chicks move quickly away. The parents need to feed them. Those young chicks are not able to pound open an oyster shell at that stage. Uh, but, so the, but they walk with the parent wherever they need to go. 
These chicks can also swim to safety. So we've had them nesting at our barrier beach and then being raised across the channel um, in the salt, near the salt marsh. So um, we can attest to that. They, are, um, they have such a long life and they are, um, and they produce three, you know, they could produce up to three chicks a year, but they really don't need to to have, maintain a stable population. They only need to produce like one chick every third year to maintain stability. Here in Massachusetts, the last time, um, just in 2023, the statewide uh, reproductivity rate was instead of like 33%, 35%, it was almost 90 to 100%. So basically one chick was coming out, was being produced out of every um, brood. However, that was not the case at Allen's Pond. We have traditionally been, you know, routinely had a bird nest at Allen's Pond, sometimes even, I mean, a pair, sometimes even two pairs. And the one pair that nested last year uh, successfully hatched all three chicks, but the parent was in a, some sort of altercation, and one of the parents, and it had a wonky wing. It could barely fly, and you could tell it was agony for it to fly. When those three chicks hatched, the, the two-parent household fell apart because the, the second parent couldn't do its job. And, um, and so all three chicks died within a, a day or two. But remember, they've got, you know, they've, they'll have produced one in three every third year, I'm sure of it. Um, so in any case, although it, it, uh, we're not gonna have those chicks this year coming back, uh, generally speaking, the birds are doing well. They were absent for over 100 years until 1969 when the first pair returned to the state of Massachusetts on one of the islands. So from the mid-19th century, basically, until 1969, the state didn't have uh, the this, this species. Since then, uh, as of 2023, we're now up to 238 pairs nesting. So we've come a long way. Most of these are nesting on the Cape. But as I said, we've got one at Allen's Pond. We've got one up in Situate that we monitor. And I know Jamie monitors them elsewhere. And Manamit monitors them along elsewhere as well. Um, they still remain a species of high concern. Um, and that is primarily because even though we're seeing a range expansion here, they are, um, they're diminishing, their number is diminishing in the core of their range. So we should expect to see more of them. And I need to speed up, so I'm gonna speed up. Um, all right, next one. Now this is a bird near and dear to my heart. Uh, piping plover, small, a little bit pudgy, sand colored. Um, the bright accents fade in the winter. Next. Uh, notice the short bill, okay? This is distinctly different than our last bird and our next bird. Um, and, and this means that it's probing in this wet substrate at a very shallow level, and it's picking up whatever it gets. It's not a specialist like the oyster catcher. This is a generalist, and they will eat amphipods and shrimps and larvae of mollusks and, and baby crabs and lots of marine worms and flies and spiders and anything they can catch in the dunes as well, beetles, crickets, all that. So wide range. They have a really neat um, way of detecting some of these critters um, and, and just watching them uh, feel for vibrations and even sort of prompt some vibrations. Is interest, it's an interesting behavior to watch. Um, these birds, I feel like, I put in that they're nutrient converters because think about the, the ocean and all the nutrients that are wrapped up in the, in the ocean, like a, this, it's just a, it's an ingredient ground, right? And now you've got all these other nutrients coming down off of a watershed into the shore. It all combines at a time of peak sunlight. So you have all the energy you need, all the ingredients you need, it is just a 
stew of productivity on the, on the shore. And this is really one of the few birds that is there 24 seven on our barrier beaches eating that thin layer of in the mud. And they are taking all that energy and converting it into piping plover being and then carting it off elsewhere. And so I, I think that not that we want them to be part of the food web to, uh, more than they should be, but ultimately, that's what it's all about, right? Is circulating all these nutrients. Um, so they are consuming every items that are in this um, prey items in this shallow intertidal zone, um, mud flats, uh, salt marshes, lagoons, um, the rack. So many, so many beaches want to clean up the seaweed rack line. That's actually just a, a banquet of uh, invertebrates for these guys, and, and especially important for chicks. And then they're also foraging in the dunes. They, they're, um, they're, they chiefly feed within five meters of the water's edge, uh, and they, and, and, but that's not necessarily great at high tide, and that's when they're more in the dunes. Next one. All right, I um, love telling kids that they have superpowers because I really think they do. One is invisibility. How many of you have been out on a beach and you've been walking along, maybe talking to your friend or just noticing, all of a sudden there's a little movement and it's a piping plover. Uh, have, has anyone else done that? Yeah? All right, they really blend in so perfectly. All stages, eggs, chicks, and adults, hiding in plain sight. Um, camouflage, cryptic, great vocabs to use with your kids and grandkids. Um, the other superpower is perseverance. If at first they don't succeed, they will try again and again and again. And if they need to, again. They can have up to four clutches in a season. Not very common to get to that number, but it's possible. So they're really well suited for a dynamic New England coast. Um, Again, as I referenced, these are devoted parents, like these other birds we're talking about, hardworking, attentive, fierce, fierce protectors, loyal to home. U.S. Post Service could mail some of these their letters because they show up in the same spot year after year. They share in parenting 50-50. Um, they also generally, a full clutch is four eggs. It takes about Five, it takes about seven days for them to lay all eggs. They lay one every other day. Um, and then it takes about 25 days to uh, incubate. And so I generally say it's about a month of egg and then another month before they fly. It takes about 25, 28 days for them to fly. So it's really eight weeks of child caring. Um, and... Uh, but if they lose any at that point, if they lose the chicks or the eggs, sorry, in the in the chick egg phase, they will start over again, and that sets the eight week clock anew. Um, so um, where was I? I lost my place. Um, there's if you are out there, if this is something of interest to you, mate, when you. Go, it's a wonderful pleasure just to watch their behavior because they have personalities. You'll see that some of them are like helicopter parents, really trying to, you know, telling the little stray kid to get back over here, or they're really laissez-faire, go out there and don't come back till dinner. Um, they really show personality. They also have some distinctive behaviors, courting behaviors, territorial uh, defense behaviors. Uh, things that, that keep predators at bay, such as um, false incubating. Let's say that they notice that a gull is watching them. Instead of going and incubating the eggs where the eggs really are, they'll go incubate another nest and try to get the, throw the gull off the idea. They're really attentive. They know that gulls are watching everything. Same with crows. They're watching everything. So um, another thing they'll do is this broken wing. How many of you have heard or seen broken wing displays? All right, so I'm not even going to talk about it. Um, so yeah, next one. All four chicks hatch within 24 hours. 
because like the oyster catcher, they are up and running and they need to actually feed themselves. The parents do not deliver food to them. They deliver the chicks to the food. Um, but they tend to stay in the safer zone of the dune and maybe down to the rack line in those first couple days. And only once the chicks are a little bit savvier do they bring them down to the wet sand. The wet sand is where the, nour the nourishing sand uh, forage is, prey items are. So that if they, in order to succeed, they need to be able to get to the wet sand, but maybe not for the first couple days. Um, they can travel a half mile in their first day if they need to, to either escape danger or get to food. It is critical that they have access to food. So we can't give them a tiny little postage stamp and expect them to fledge. Um, they are, their chances of survival uh, increase exponentially if they get to the point of flying. It's that four, that four week, one month window they need to survive and then they're good to go. Um, and at that point they're full size, they're same size as their parents, a little different coloring though. Next one. These guys are not waterproof. <laughs> All right, they're, they, it takes them uh, several weeks before they actually have the feathers that will provide them with a measure of thermoregulation and waterproofing. Um, so the, the parents do an enormous job of protecting them. Um, and, and they are, one point is that they, these, the, the birds as a species are hardwired to perceive threats and act according to a program. So if they perceive the, a threat of a, of a predator, a, a mammalian predator, they will act accordingly. They will not dis discern, differentiate between a dog, a 16-year-old blind and you know, immobile dog, from a coyote. They will act the same way, and that means stopping what they're doing with their young and going and distracting that predator away. So one point is that they're not that plastic in some of their behaviors, and that has probably been, been one of the reasons that they are on the endangered species list. So in 1986, half the world's population of piping plovers uh, nested only on the Atlantic coast. And half of them nested only in Massachusetts. So we had a quarter of the world's population in 1986, and we still have that today. The difference is, in 1986, we had uh, 270 birds, 135 pairs. 270 birds represented a quarter. There's only 1,000 in the, in the planet, right? That's when they were listed as endangered. Now, and, and, I, and actually, all, everyone think back to 1986. What was, the be what was your beach experience? How did you feel? Go what did going to the beach entail? For me, like, it did not entail respecting nesting birds. It, they weren't even an issue. I never went to a beach with a nesting bird because they weren't there. Um, that was not my experience. That's not my culture. That's what we're dealing with, I think, today, is people, my age anyway, grew up expecting a certain way of, act, of, act, of recreational freedom on the beach that now we're being, you know, we're asking them to change. But anyway, back to, um, back to the uh, 1986. Today, we have, we had 1,000 birds back in 1986 on the planet. Now we have 10,000, almost. That's a tenfold increase. Pretty darn good. It's taken 40 years, almost 40 years, but that's still good. Uh, my team last year, um, we monitored 74 birds, uh, 37 pairs. Jamie, what was your number? Do you remember how many pairs you monitored? I think there was a total of, um, I think there was a total of like 81 on Buzzards Bay. So yeah, 82 on Buzzards Bay. So between DCR and Jamie and some others, there was um, another 45 pairs. So 37 pairs was what my team was monitoring, and they produced 38 fledglings, which is not bad, not great. Uh, 1.25 would have been great, would, would have been good. But the problem is that we had 24 of our pairs are at Allen's Pond. That's a huge proportion. That's 
That's 1% of the world's population <laughs> is at Allen's Pond. I think, I think that's right. Um, maybe it's 1% of the coastal, I kind of forget. Anyway, um, moving on. Okay, so challenges. Lots of different issues. I'm not going to go over it. We can only really manage weather and tidal impacts. The recurring problems of dogs, Memorial Day storms, July 4th, all of these here, those recurring problems are things that some of which we can manage a little bit better. Um, for example, if we had dogs off the beach starting in early April so that the birds had their first chicks mobile before Memorial Day, that would make an enormous difference because then those chicks would also be fledged before 4th of July. If we could get all, you know, at least a good proportion of the chicks fledged by July 4th, the, pair, the uh, problem would go be much better managed. Um, so what I think we're looking at is, uh, as far as some solutions, you can go to the next one, is essentially thinking out some better uh, or rethinking the etiquette of fun, of, of recreation, changing that a little bit. And, um, and so we've had some successful solutions, like the legal protections of the Endangered Species Act and the guidelines that are produced uh, which Mass Audubon and, and the Lloyd Center and others help beach managers uh, meet those guidelines, meet those conditions. And if we do all of these things, if we do the planning and the monitoring and the symbolic fencing and everything, um, then we, there's a lot of other benefits that are realized. Uh, there's projects are more permitted because there's a favorable uh, re regard for those beach managers by the permitting agencies. Uh, we get more coastal resilience because our dune is better protected. There's less trash on the beach for anyone to experience. We have fewer experience, negative experiences with dogs or fireworks and other things. And we could really leverage some um, revenue opportunities. There's a lot of birders out there. They like to spend money. There's only 10,000 piping plovers in the world and Massachusetts has a quarter of them. Why aren't we like Rwanda for gorillas with making this a money-making venture? Um, all right, next one. Gina, I know, I gotta stop. You know, we've gotta stop. Yeah, okay. We've got only 10 minutes to clear out. Okay. And these have been fascinating. But the red knot will save for another time. That sounds good. Okay, or, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, but I know, I know. Yeah, I didn't. You are so enthusiastic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Anyway, check some of the stuff back there. Thanks all for coming. See you next week if you can't make it. Okay. Uh,